Siren Kierkegaard, Various Readings Christian Ethics, General Part, by Dr. H. Martinson Translated by C. Spence, 1891 Pages 302 to 305 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Imitation of Christ and Justifying Faith In another form, the setting aside of the Redeemer and of justification by faith as here described is to be found in recent times in the religious writings of S. Kierkegaard. Here the example is set forth, not with a contemplative nor with a mystic bearing, but in relation to practical asceticism, in relation to the works of Christianity, and more especially to the sufferings connected with these. Union to Christ's human and divine personality is here represented as a demand to believe the divine paradox, that God became man, to believe against reason by virtue of the absurd, but the significance of this divine miracle is to Kierkegaard entirely merged in Christ's manifestation as the example. To follow Christ is with him all in all. When first through a miracle we have attained the perception of the fact, imperceptible to the multitude, in his form of a servant, Kierkegaard desires, as we have explained in the foregoing part of this work, to break down the monstrous illusion of nominal Christianity, that all, without further conditions, are Christians. He desires, in opposition to the cheap Christianity of the multitude, to set it at a higher price, to make its demands valid, because men have too long contented themselves with Christ's benefits. His fundamental idea is that what concerns a man is to live his life as the individual, and that the individual who is to become a Christian must find himself alone, alone in the whole world, alone face to face with God. Whilst the mystic at times allows the individual pantheistically to be swallowed up in the depth of divinity, and thereby denies the principle of personality and the ethical, which he in other moments acknowledges, but from the barb of which he escapes by plunging for a time into the pantheistic ocean. Kierkegaard's ethical tendency shows itself in this, that in full earnestness he maintains the individual in his validity, face to face with the personal God. He discovers this principle by not, like the mystics, fixing his contemplation merely on man's finiteness and misery, but also seeking in the most earnest manner to awaken not only consciousness of sin, but moreover consciousness of guilt. Religious consciousness of guilt is the strongest practical evidence of the infinite value of human personality. For although man, in the consciousness of his guilt, feels himself to be absolutely unworthy, he is at the same time aware that his guilt has infinite significance to God himself, who appointed him to everlasting bliss. In this combination of the consciousness of guilt with the anticipation of eternal salvation is just the infinite pain of this consciousness. But the more Kierkegaard thus exalts the importance of the individual, the more earnestly he sets forth the principle of personality and personal relation to God, the more determinedly he aims at leading the individual to Christ, in order that the individual, by the imitation of Christ, may attain the eternal bliss which by sin and guilt is lost. The more he urges the consciousness of guilt in the demands of the law, the more must it be felt as a misguiding error that he only leads the individual with the oppressive consciousness of his sin and his guilt to the example, but not to the Redeemer. The example is torn apart from the ground of reconciliation, and appropriation is therefore entirely set aside by Kierkegaard, whilst he impatiently hastens on to ascetic exercises and deeds of love, and in indignation over the many who call themselves Christians without being really so, does not give himself time for the due consideration of Christ's work of love, of atonement by Christ, of justification by faith, of the sacraments as a means of divine grace for the sinner's forgiveness, nourishment, and spiritual growth. 
of the influence of the Holy Ghost through the church, of the sustaining and supporting power of church fellowship for the individual, there is little or nothing to be heard in this system of Christian instruction. Where some glimpses of this do appear, as it were, in passing, they are not wrought out or digested, the results are not brought forward, so that thus they receive no determining, no absorbing significance. With power the example only is brought forth, and the demand springing from this, especially the demand to follow Christ in his sufferings. With power is only brought forth what he calls the paradox of faith, namely that God became man in the midst of time, and that eternal bliss is joined to the imitation of this marvelous example, who by his revelation awakens the offense of the world and of our own hearts. But of Christ's work a very imperfect explanation is given. Christ's work, according to Kierkegaard, is essentially merged in his prophetic office, in the revelation of the absolute witness of truth, who, though he addresses himself to all, will have nothing to do with the multitude, who only desires to be what he is, the truth to the individual, who is therefore rejected by the multitude, mocked and crucified. But of Christ's sufferings as high priest, of the great sacrifice which he offered for the sin of the world, in order to satisfy divine justice, which we cannot do, whilst the consciousness of guilt craves a satisfaction, an expiation of transgression, scarcely any mention is made. Again and again we are told of the sacrifice we ourselves should bring, of the sufferings we ourselves must endure, because in our sufferings we imitate the sufferings of Christ. But in this manner we are led back more and more to the ascetic errors of the Middle Ages, from which the Reformation has delivered us. Although Kierkegaard is opposed to the cloister life and self-imposed penances of the Middle Ages, yet it is not manifest that his own system, which unquestionably sharpens the consciousness of guilt, yet without admitting the propitiation of Christ as a determining factor in the work of salvation, is aught else but a repetition of the same in the midst of the Protestant world of the 19th century. A life carried out on the views of Kierkegaard, in which consciousness of sin and consciousness of guilt are essential ingredients, in which the believer exists, without this believer having found justifying faith, can only become a life of penitence. And as consciousness of sin craves propitiation, but the propitiation of Christ is absent, we return to the self-accomplished propitiation, because eternal salvation must be attained by a continued exercise of suffering and self-denial. Undoubtedly, we also hear that eternal salvation is the gift of God's free grace and compassionate love, but this grace only comes afterwards, in the future life in heaven, when the man, first on earth by his own exertion, has achieved all necessary preparations. Christianity, on the other hand, teaches us not a grace which only comes afterwards, but a grace which is far in advance for man, an anticipating grace which comes to meet him, which from his birth receives man in its arms in baptism, which Kierkegaard ended by rejecting, a grace which step by step accompanies him to the grave, and which, to him who in faith devotes himself to it, becomes sustaining grace, which alone makes it possible for the man to strive after likeness to Christ. Doubtless, Kierkegaard also speaks of a guidance in the life of the individual, by which in his own concerns he is brought to admire the goodness of God, and what the impotence of man can accomplish by divine assistance. But this guidance is without any connection with the appointments of God's grace in his church, and it must certainly appear paradoxical to us that this same guidance which, according to Kierkegaard's own expression, must have so great a share in his authorship, should through more than eighteen centuries have been completely inactive and indifferent in regard to the greatest phenomenon in history, to Christ's church on earth, which throughout these centuries must have appeared as an institution which had failed in essentials, which had admitted the multitude. For us, the question can only be, if even this authorship has pointed out to us God's saving grace, which is revealed to all men, has revealed to us the way of salvation, by which God will lead all men 
whilst he at the same time in his word warns us against all self-elected and self-discovered ways it is this which we must deny we do not deny that his religious teaching may exert a preparing and awakening influence in many respects may serve to arouse anxiety and earnestness but in so far as this hermit sentiment is intended to give us a right view of what it is to become a Christian and right views of the imitation of Christ, we consider its tenets as containing a deep and perilous mistake. End of recording. Christian Ethics, General Part, by Dr. H. Martinson, translated by C. Spence, 1891, pages 302 to 305.